I killed and ate a man after seeing an ad on the internet looking for someone who was willing to be eaten alive. My name is Armin Maywes. I was born in Germany in 1961 and have been developing cannibalistic fantasies since childhood. This led to a terrible act in 2000. At that time, I published an advert on the internet looking for volunteers who were willing to be killed and eaten. A man named Baron Brandis replied and came a month after mutual agreement. I killed him and began devouring his flesh. We filmed part of the crime. I ate his flesh for several months. In 2002, the police discovered my actions after an investigation and I was arrested for my crime. I was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison for the murder of a man. In 2004, my case was reopened and my sentence increased. I was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Since then, I've been in prison and my story has gained worldwide notoriety. I'm A. What's a historical fact that you had to learn on your own and not in school? In 1979, during the apartheid era, the South African police took it upon themselves to buy a farm that was 20 kilometers outside of Pretoria called Flakblas. This is an aerial view of the farm. So after these police guys bought this farm, they transferred it to the South African Department of Public Works and they used this as a torturing and execution site. So they would they were basically a hit squad that would take political opponents and bring them here to torture them and sometimes convert them to start being insiders for the South African apartheid government. This squad operated from 1979 all the way to 1990. The existence of this place wasn't even made public until 1990, and that is because someone was about to get executed for a non-political related crime and confessed that they knew of this place and things that were going on there, which prompted an investigation and basically them not being executed on the spot because they needed more information. Political opponents of the apartheid government knew that whoever was brought here would never come out alive. And if they came out alive, then there's someone to watch because they might be spying. It's believed that there are hundreds of bodies that are buried on this farm. In 2001, there was a healing ceremony that was held to kind of declare it as a national site. And then some years later, it also became like a rehabilitation center as well as like some kind of like a church. Once the existence of this place was revealed in 1990, the way they hurried to pack everything up and dispose of it. And interestingly enough, the people who operated Fluck Plus also used to use this place as a way of kind of like funneling government funds for personal use as well as like laundering and corruption and all kinds of shit. It was basically the untraceable unit of the country. Although the identities of most of the people who worked on Fluck Plus are known, none of them went to prison for their crimes. What really happened to rapper Little Tay and how did she pass? Guys, make sure to click the plus sign. I'm going to have more on this. Sound off in the comments and tell me what you think because there are several theories out there and we're going to dive into it. And one of the biggest rumors is that there was a ski boat accident in Canada and there were other kids on board, including a 14-year-old girl. And the 14-year-old girl's the only one that passed. However, that hasn't been confirmed and now it's coming out that was somebody different. As well, Little Tay's brother passed and we don't know the timing of that. Some people are saying that actually happened happened a while ago, but we're finding out about it just now. And now the death is under investigation. Well, the Daily Mail says they know what happened. Now on the Instagram, this is what the family wrote. They said, during the time of immense sorrow, we kindly ask for privacy as we grieve the overwhelming loss as the circumstances surrounding Claire and her brother's passing are still under investigation. It concluded Claire will forever remain in our hearts, her absence leaving an irreplaceable void that will be felt by all who knew and loved her. It says the cause of the ending was not been revealed, but there's speculation that she passed away after getting into a car accident since Twitter user named Jesse Ryan claimed to have witnessed the incident himself. It says he wrote, as someone who was at the scene, I can confirm that both were together, her and her brother, when passing due to car collision, the brother. I'm gonna say local officials are speculating texting and driving being the cause and the other vehicle occupants were okay with minor injuries. Lil Tay's father, Christopher Hope, declined to comment when contacted. Now, this has not been confirmed, but there is one theory that she's actually still alive and I'm gonna dive into it guys tell me what you think do you think this is what's going on do you think there's something else there's a lot of weird stuff and it's under investigation what do you think that means and we know from Carly Russell what under investigation means sound off in the comments click the plus sign I've got more coming. man no 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 there needs to be no trial put him in jail automatically and sentence him for life because there's no reason that he should be getting a trial right now with all the evidence pointing against him goofy alert Oh, you don't know who this is? This is Dr. Chang, a New York doctor 
who was secretly putting his patients to sleep so he can do unspeakable things on them. The only reason they found out what he was doing was because he got so bored he decided to do it to his own girlfriend. This man put an unknown liquid on a mask, put it on his girlfriend, then she went to sleep, woke up, could not remember anything. She looked in his phone and found videos of her that she could not remember and videos of multiple other patients and ex-girlfriends. Oh, but it gets worse. When they looked into his belongings, what do you think they found? They found knockout gas and a whole lot of illegal narcotics that he should not have. He used all those to brew a concoction in order to put these innocent women to bed while he did his unbelievable disgusting acts. Yet you guys are trying to give him a trial? What does he need a trial for? Put him in jail. Put him in jail and announce to the whole prison why is he in prison right now, bro? A prayer goes out to the victims. You guys did not deserve that unspeakable thing happening to you. I'm sorry. I hope you get justice. This is the story of Crystal Anderson, a 30-year-old mother of four children who was described as a great friend, sister and mom. She loved dancing and making TikTok videos, and most of all, she loved spending time with her four children. However, beneath the surface, Crystal was living in fear for her safety and the safety of her loved ones, while suffering from domestic abuse at the hands of her boyfriend, Tony Berry. Tragically, one fateful night, Crystal disappeared. And what would be revealed surrounding her disappearance would devastate her family and all of those who knew and loved her. Welcome to Viral Crimes. Subscribe and hit the bell icon for more stories. This story takes us to Wagoner, South Carolina. Wagoner is a small town located in Aiken County, South Carolina, United States. The town has several parks and recreational areas. Overall, Wagoner is a quiet charming town with a strong sense of community and a rich history. 30-year-old Crystal Anderson was a makeup and hairstylist, as well as a social media influencer. I just went live and I did not end my life. Um, TikTok actually did it themselves. themselves. Like, I didn't do nothing wrong. Like, why did you blame me TikTok? And I can't go live until the 22nd. Why? I didn't do nothing wrong. Why? She would often post videos dancing alone or with her kids on TikTok. She comes from a big family. She has 17 siblings and 4 children. She was in a relationship with 48-year-old Tony Berry. The relationship was reportedly abusive, and Crystal would leave the relationship several times and always return allegedly due to fear that Tony would harm her or her family. Despite Crystal's personal struggles, Crystal tried her best to keep her spirits high and continue making fun videos, all the while hiding the pain and trauma she was experiencing. Crystal loved posting on her social media, but all of a sudden, she stopped posting and no one had heard from her. Crystal was last seen on August 20, 2022, at her Wagoner, South Carolina home. Three days later on Tuesday, August 23, Crystal's sister, Shadira, said that she received a troubling phone call from one of Crystal's baby fathers, informing her that Sunday, Crystal had neglected to pick up their son from his residence, and he had not heard from her the next day on Monday going into Tuesday. Shadira became concerned right away since she knew Crystal wouldn't be late to pick up her kids. Shadira immediately called Crystal's live-in boyfriend, Tony Berry, and also the father to her seven-year-old son. He said he hadn't seen Crystal since Saturday at one o'clock in the morning. Shadira asked him why he didn't report her missing. Before her Facebook post, Ellie Williams had already accused multiple men of rape. One of those was 18-year-old Jordan Trengove. His life would change forever after a night out with Ellie in 2019. At that time, I wanted to go try for an apprenticeship in the yard, in the shipbuilding yard. Yeah, I was just in the process of like getting everything for my application. I was planning my birthday, stuff like that with my mate. I was just living my life. Live a life that a normal person should do. Me and two friends went out and we put on our Snapchat story that we were out. Ellie replied to it on the Snapchat story saying, can I come out with you? I've got no one to go out with. And us just being nice, like wanting to make a friend and stuff like that. We just said, yeah. 
she turned up and from then it was we just carried on with our night out little did we know it was all part of a wicked little plan I only knew her as like just a staff member in the biggest nightclub in the town of Manhattan. You'd always see the staff members and you just chat to them, but I never knew her as like an actual, actual friend. Later that night, Jordan says he and Ellie separated after his friend got into a fight. He later went back to a local nightclub to find her. I was supposed to meet Ellie back in town where she used to work in Manhattan. And when I got back, she was gone and I said to them uh, the staff where she worked so because I knew they were her friends I said like do you know where Ellie is and they said yeah she's gone home she's being sick so I went out and continued my own night and then obviously I went home with a di completely different female a week later Jordan was arrested on suspicion of rape I was just asleep in my bed and I just woke up and there was just about six eight police officers at the bottom of my bed and they were telling me that i was being arrested for a rape and and dbh on on my girlfriend and i was like i don't have a girlfriend what you's going on about and they were like ellie williams and i was like no the worst day of my life you know no one wants to be arrested for rape when i got to the police station they started explaining what was going on and she was trying to say i raped her on this night out how can someone actually do this to someone the evidence is there, I haven't done anything. I said to them, there'll be CCTV, you know, there's pictures, traced my phone. They just wanted to listen to her. I was confused. I said to my mum, like, if I go to prison, I'm not going to be coming out alive, I'm coming out in a box. I, I going in there as a rapist, you know, it's not going to go down well. And if you're going on a sex offence in prison, you're bound to get some sort of damage put towards you. The police went on to charge Jordan with rape. He spent 10 weeks in custody, surrounded by convicted sex offenders. It was making me quite suicidal because I was just ripped away from my family for no reason at all. I was in a cell with an actual convicted paedophile. He told me he pleaded guilty to sending images to an eight-year-old kid. He did not want to be on that wing at all. That's Millwall, all on the opposite side of the road. There's the pub there, with Millwall all inside. And this is all West Ham walking past. They're going to have to something, aren't they? There they go. We're getting round here. They're going to have a crack at the pub. That's where it'll go. Look, look, look they're going to do the pub now. Look, they're doing it. Come on, they're doing it now. Yeah, it'll be excellent, Metro 750. Urgent assistance. Uh, just outside the crown and anchor. <laughs> you are, aren't you? You're doing yourself. Yeah. Good. Little Georgia Williams is her parents' pride and joy. By the time she reaches high school, Georgia's popular among her peers and is chosen to be the head girl. Among her friends is Jamie Reynolds. Jamie's a few years older. He went to school with Georgia's sister, Scarlett and the whole family know him. Well, initially, um, obviously, Jamie knew Scarlett, and we all, the rest of the family then, knew Jamie because he works at our local garage, which is also a shop. Jamie is on the edge of Georgia's social circle, and at times he seems lonely. Georgia tries to include him and make him feel part of the group. She did say to me, um, that he had broached the subject of taking her out and things like this. She had always, in a, she was always thinking of other people. What's the nicest way I can say this to him, Scarlett? How can I? I want to stay friends with him. How do I say this and and, and not hurt his feelings? Jamie Reynolds cuts a forlorn figure. He's 23 years old, lonely, and bored of his job. He wants to be a professional photographer, and needs a portfolio. So. He asks Georgia and some of her friends to help him by coming to his parents' house for a photo shoot. May the 26th, 2013, just after 7.30 in the evening, 17-year-old Georgia Williams is heading to Jamie Reynolds' house. She's meeting friends there and taking part in a photo shoot. I knew Jamie, I knew where he lived up the road. It's only five minutes' walk. I, I was okay with that. But the 
were going to be other friends turning up that night. Uh, and, and we had nothing to worry about. But what Georgia doesn't know is that none of her other friends are coming. Jamie Reynolds' mum and dad are away on holiday. They are all alone. It got to about half ten and Lynette sent a text message saying, where are you and what are you doing? She got a text message back um, saying, um, oh, um, I've, I've, I've left with some friends. I'm going to be out for a while. Um, I'll see you later. What Georgia's parents don't realise is that it isn't their daughter who sent the text message. It's Jamie Reynolds. Completely unaware, Georgia's parents are reassured by the text message and head off to bed. But Georgia doesn't come home that night. We had no real concerns. It was about six in the morning and then that text again. Got no answer. But then, round about half seven, eight, there was an answer uh, saying, I stayed, I did stay at a friend's, I'm fine, I'll see you later, but my battery is dying too, T double O. Monday, May the 27th, and Georgia's due to go to a music festival with friends. Her parents assume she's gone straight there. We were still, I think in our, in our minds, she's with somebody that she knows and that she'll be back. And we booked for her first driving lesson on the Tuesday morning. So we knew that she'd be back for that come what may, because she couldn't wait to go out and have her first lesson. But I said, you know what? I says, she's never played up. She's never had this rebellion. I said, I just wonder if she thought, you know what? I'm going to ignore them for a day and show them that I'm old enough to do my own thing and whatever. Tuesday morning, and there's still no sign of Georgia. Steve decides to call the police and report his daughter missing. Police run a routine check on Jamie Reynolds and discover he has a dark past. In 2008, he was given a police caution for trying to strangle a young woman. They decide to take urgent action. The police rang me then and said, Steve, we're outside the house. There's no sign of life here, we're gonna put the door in. Now that really sounded alarm bells for me. We'd got no idea that Reynolds was in any way a dangerous person. And we actually sat up in our bedroom and we saw all the police cars going by. Once inside, police carry out a search of the house. There's no sign of Jamie Reynolds or Georgia. They started searching for Jamie Reynolds. Uh, they went to his place of employment. Uh, there was no trace of him. They started looking at vehicles and th they found out that there was a, a van missing, his father's van. 2.30 Wednesday morning. Police find the missing van, 280 miles away outside a budget hotel in Glasgow. Jamie Reynolds is taken in for questioning, but there's still no sign of Georgia. Reynolds was asked a single question, where is Georgia Williams, to which he replied, I don't know. He was then arrested and he was brought back to West Mercia. 5.30 Wednesday morning. It's now almost three days since Georgia's disappearance. Two senior police officers knock on Steve and Lynette's door. And that's when we both panicked, because we knew that we wouldn't have high-ranking officers knocking on our door at five o'clock in the morning to tell us good news. Lynette was stood there. I was still in my dressing gown, and I said, he's killed her, hasn't he? He's killed her. Lynette was shouting, no, no, don't say that. Um, and I said, Lynette, he's killed her. I said, that's what they're going to say, isn't it? That's, that's what going to say. And and they were saying, Steve, you know, that might be the case. Shortly after his return to West Mercia, we discovered articles in his house that showed us that Georgia Williams had been, in fact, murdered. Um, a camera within the house was found to contain 
a memory card that had been cleaned but not sufficiently enough for us to recover a number of images that depicted Georgia naked and dead. The worst fears of Georgia's family have been confirmed. There's not words to mean and people use devastated and stuff like that. There isn't a word to describe. I died that day. Reynolds is described as a potential serial killer. He's jailed for life and is told he will never be released. These two mothers in Las Vegas took their own lives five months apart from each other. And suspiciously, they had been fighting the Las Vegas Police Department over an alleged double homicide cover-up. And this double homicide had ties allegedly to a child sex trafficking ring. So this is Judge Melanie Andreas Tobiasen. She was 55 years old and on January 20th, 2023, after stepping down from her position as a judge a year ago, she took a gun and ended her life in her $2 million Las Vegas mansion. And on the left here is Connie Land. Connie was Judge Melanie's 53-year-old friend. Her daughter, along with her boyfriend who is alleged to be her pimp, were murdered in 2016. And on August 10th, 2022, after fighting for justice for six years for her daughter, Connie took her own life, which means that both of these women are now dead. So let's step back to a year before the murders happened. At this point, Judge Melanie is tipping off local authorities about the presence of an underage sex ring that's operating in Las Vegas. She's going on podcasts trying to raise the alarm. She's writing this down on court documents. And eventually, Melanie met Connie. But why did Melanie meet Connie? Well, apparently, Melanie thought that a man named Sugar Shane Valentine, the same man that had tried to lure her own daughter into prostitution, was the man that murdered Connie's daughter and her alleged boyfriend, Pimp. And this judge was a badass. She just wanted to find the truth and to expose this ring. She went on record one time and said that she went to Sugar Shane Valentine's house and kicked his door in asking for answers. And she even stated at one time that she had verbally threatened him because the police were not assisting her in her investigation whatsoever. She had presented the police with lots of evidence that this guy was involved in this sex trafficking ring. She knew that there were pedophiles linked to this ring that were directly profiting off of all of this and she was passionate about finding the truth and protecting children. But unfortunately, a lot of times stories like this end in bizarre and strange circumstances. So apparently for a while before her death, Melanie had been telling loved ones of hers, remember, if I die, I didn't do it. She even told friends and family members that she was being followed. She knew she was being watched and she had been threatened. Apparently the hub for this sex trafficking ring was a clothing store called Top Notch. And the judge had tried to raise all these concerns about this store. Eventually, though, the store shut down because of a murder that occurred right out front, and the owner was arrested and sentenced to 45 years in prison for shooting and killing his own girlfriend, so obviously this was not a good place. She went on the record, though, and said that when she brought information about what was going on at Top Notch to the police, they ignored her. They said that they knew that places like this existed all over Vegas, but that they were kind of untouchable and that it was dangerous for her to go down this path. Something bizarre is that a number of detectives in Las Vegas have been told that they've been told to forget about and lay off of child sex trafficking stings and operations. It's kind of scary to think of how much power these organizations have and it is suspicious that these two women that were fighting for justice died from allegedly their own hands only months apart from each other. Please, help me. 